Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our show, Success Wealth. And today with my host, Phil Newen, we're going to interview Catherine Cashmore. Catherine has been in the real estate game for decades now. She's not only acted as a buyer's advocate for thousands of her clients, but also has lectured widely as well as in the advice on economic investments. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you. Really delighted to be here. Same. So please, Catherine, for those of our viewers who don't know a lot of what of your work, please introduce yourself and, and let us know what is it can help the investors and buyers. Sure. Um, well, I do a few things. One is that I run a buyer advocacy agency where obviously I help buyers, developers, investors invest in real estate, you know, working out strategies, what they want to buy, different acquisitions, so on and so forth. The other things that I do is I'm also president of the uh, oldest economic organization in Australia called Prosper Australia, where we really advocate for economic reform and uh, that, that kind of forms the basis of taxation reform. But we do within that, within our organization, we do a lot of studies on land, land economics, land cycles, why land prices increase, how to make land affordable. And we um, spend a lot of time talking to government and policymakers and uh, talking about what, what they can actually do to make a more equitable society, to use a bit of a buzzword. And then obviously I also write for Portlet Publishing. I write a couple of uh, publications for them. Uh, one is called Cycles, Trends and Forecasts, where we forecast what is going to happen economically based on the land cycle and then the other one is Cashmore's Real Estate Wealth where I work just solely with a group of investors, people that subscribe to that have access to be able to email me and ask me questions and I write modules for them just going to a much deeper level um, on how to buy land and the things to look for and, and what to avoid you know the kind of spruiking and the you know strategies out there which are going to lead them into dead ends so so that's it in a nutshell, really. Fantastic. And you know what? What I do love about most about when I followed you and also property cycles and trends is that you use data and indicators to forecast what you actually, you know, the strategies that you, you purchase in the next few years. That's what attracted me, uh, the, you know, the, the last uh, following your work. So can you please share with our viewers where we are at in the property clock indicator? So with the, the 12 o'clock and are we in, in the phase of crash or give us some indication of what we should look for in the next few years? Yeah, so I mean, if we're talking about property clocks, I don't actually use them. The property clock, I think that you've, you've shown me on a slide uh, previously was from one of my former colleagues, uh, Phil Anderson, who put that together. But the usual notion of a property clock is that you have this kind of pattern that happens in real estate, which uh, takes you up to the economic boom, a <laughs> time where real estate is going gangbusters and everything's looking great and sunny. And then, of course, it takes you down the other side where basically private gets de debt gets too high, land prices get too high, the productive sectors of the economy have been eroded away and you see this called a domino effect going down and where we are currently in the cycle and particularly do you want me to talk a little bit about the 18 year cycle for anybody that might be listening and not familiar with it is that um, the next question that we're going to ask you so <laughs> might as well into it yeah. <laughs> that's actually because um, it's kind of hard yeah because <laughs> yeah, i mean really you know j well just to kind of key off on this one to directly answer your point so i'm not avoiding a question like a politician but i mean what we would be expecting to see really is everything that's happening now and that is cannot but have rising real estate prices when you have banks that are implementing policies that ease lending and allow them to lend more you have governments implementing home buyer grants which we are all very familiar with and and really this time developer grants but specifically for the big developers and also we have such a great degree of infrastructure investment on a global scale breaking absolute records and when you understand how the economy works and land really sits at the base of the economy, we need your first lesson ever in, uh, if you're really studying economics uh, and not just from an economics textbook, but from the reality of what happens is that land sits at the base of the economic cycle. We need it for everything that we do. We live on it, work on it, eat from it, breathe from it. And so as you force, you know, the, what usually happens with the wealth in society is land 
is one of the only things that is fixed in supply, meaning that there's only a small proportion of it in areas which are well facilitated, and that's the type of land that we need. And therefore, as money comes into the society and society enriches itself and everything, you, the land basically takes those gains. So as economies progress and there's more technological progression and people you know, get wealthier, then you'll see land prices rise and, and take the bulk of that kind of wealth, particularly alongside bank lending. So, you know, with all of that's happening, even though we're in a downturn at the moment, it's really one of the reasons why the land market isn't collapsing. But it's also a reason why once we get through this period of time, we're going to see land prices increase and probably the greatest boom that we've seen up until the peak of the cycle. Kind of put that into context with the 18 year cycle. Yes, now that's leading to the 18 year cycle question. Um, that when you said boom later on, I think a lot of investors uh, is pricked up. And so, please, Afram, please enlighten us with this 18 years property cycle. Does it still apply with the COVID happening? Is yeah, it track on, on with this 18 years property cycle. Yeah. So, <laughs> the uh, in terms of the 18 year, the 18 years and cycle is an economic cycle, but it was discovered in relation to property in the 1930s by uh, Homer Hoyt, who was probably the first economist that came across it. You have to remember with um, you know, grain prices and cotton prices and coffee prices, we have data that goes back centuries and centuries, but land prices, sale prices, which we are so used to now going onto a computer and it all being digitized and being able to trace back what houses bought and sold for, that's quite a modern innovation. And in the 1930s, the crash, the Great Depression had been so bad that economists um, at the time wanted to find out the reasons for it, just as we see now with 2008 and the crashes in, our, in recent memory. And um, Homer Hoyt was one that decided he was going to look at what had been happening within his uh, local area. He wrote um, 100 year, Years of Land Values in Chicago. And he had a look at the pattern of land sales. And so he collected data from different real estate agencies, from newspaper, newspaper adverts. He wasn't the only one. There were other um, analysts that were looking at this around the same time. Another guy called Roy Wenslick, Clarence Long was another one. Anyway, quite a few economists were sort of looking at this question. But what Homer Hoyt discovered, and he was perhaps the first, was that Chicago had this 18-year pattern where um, land would kind of go through this boom cycle and then at the end of the 18 years there would be this sharp downturn in the economy basically a land collapse and that was actually what had happened in the great depression so much concentration is put on the fact that it was a wall street crash but when you looked at the land data there was an incredible amount of speculation going on particularly in florida and other areas of the us and so homer hoyt obviously the research was taken up as i mentioned his name before roy wenslick who was a real estate valuer lecturer lectured on this cycle widely with charts and you know actually wrote kind of the real estate analyst which was a publication, the first of its type really, for investors and, and people to chart real estate prices. And obviously he discovered this pattern as well. And it became a well you know, recognized thing that there was this 18 year cycle that where you would get roughly around 14 years of rising land prices. It wasn't kind of really set. And then a sharp downturn at the um, end of the cycle. Well, the, uh, other, other people that kind of took it up more in modern times, obviously the pioneer really of bringing it to the forefront was a chap called Fred Harrison, who's an economist in the UK, who started uh, his career as a journalist and then also wanted to study economics because he was writing about it and went and did a course on a chap called Henry George, Georgist Economics, which really is forms the base of the economic organization that I'm involved with. And that's how I became involved with Fred Harrison and obviously Phil Anderson, who I spoke about before, who put together the property clock, which you have a slide of. He used to work for us at Prosper. So we all kind of came from, but you know, it was really Georgists that were looking at what happens to the land and how the land affects the economy. Anyway, Fred Harrison did the research in England and could trace this cycle right back to the 16th century. Phil Anderson has done research in the US. He's written a great book on it where he kind of traces this land cycle back in the US. And, and there's others also, you know, sort of that you can, you can look back at the lit literature and see analyzing the prices. 
the way that the 18 year cycle works and it's incredibly regular and it's most visible in the US and most visible in the UK is that there are two recessions. One is one that comes midway through the cycle, the midpoint cycle as Fred Harrison turned it or the mid cycle slowdown as sometimes has, has uh, been used where the economy will suffer a recession but it doesn't normally involve a land price led collapse and then obviously at the end of the 18 year cycle is when you would normally see property collapse a flood of foreclosures hit the market and <laughs> property price you know a severe downturn and obviously because property is um you know when you have a recession in the economy you can have a stock market panic and a stock market crash and it can affect it, it usually affects the wealthy but when you have a property crash it affects everybody it affects the mum and dads the ones that own it affects the the everybody who owns property and you know because that's such a large proportion of the community so the the effect is very lasting is what i'm trying to say <laughs> so th that's really how the 18 year cycle wor works it has been interrupted in the us by war so the first world war and the second world war it can be interrupted obviously by policy so real estate is very affected by economic policy much more so than the stock market which is very reactionary in terms of australia that's actually the best lesson that you can get for Australia because I've investigated obviously going back in Australia and looked at all the history of it and although we have correlated with downturns in the 18 year cycle we've also missed downturns so 1840 was a significant downturn for us 1890 was 1930 was also although not as bad as 1890 which was the gold boom and bust so a tremendous amount of money went into real estate and if any of your listeners are in Melbourne then they'll know the uh, big mansions down St Kilda Road and that were kind of constructed and built at that time. A lot of stunning architecture. And um, then over the last three cycles, we've synchronized. And the reason that we've synchronized is because unlike our history, which was quite economically progressive, where we didn't really encourage speculation in real estate and we it was far more heavily taxed and we had far less taxes on income and productivity. So we, we were very progressive in a lot of ways um, in Australia and in New Zealand. That's not how we are anymore. <laughs> so what we have now is economy that really does punish workers, laborers and productivity. And uh, they are taxed very highly compared to land, which is uh, taxed low and obviously our taxation policies taxation always dictates how you invest and so people pour their money into the land market so we do see that pattern occurring in australia and that's where you're a big advocate of prosper is um, looking at that tax and how to try to get reform in that area to rebalance and be more progressive like we were is that right yeah there is only one way look um, there's only one way to create equality and fairness within an economy and you hear those buzz buzzwords used a lot mm -hmm. so um right now where we are now in crisis now you'll you'll look at something like the world economic forum where they're talking about oh we're going to transform our economy and it's not keynesian and it's not this and it's not that but it's going to be all form of sustainability and you know we're going to create wealth for everybody well you cannot create wealth for everybody whilst you allow monopoly of that wealth mm -hmm. and land of course is one of the well-known ways of creating um, is basically a monopoly market it's uh, the banks lend 80 to 90 percent against land as collateral particularly more so in the booms of the cycle it's a little bit less at the moment um, and uh, you know when you allow land prices to continue going upwards and it all funded by private debt it just erodes away the productive sectors of the economy and it creates the divides that we see that people talk about the gap you know the 99 percent and so on and so forth and so it's a repeating cycle that is caused by the way economics works and it has a obviously a long history behind it as to why we are like that now it's a plan that, that has been devised um by governments and we all buy into it and you know without sort of going into the to the whole explanation of what we're trying to do at prosper is make it visible because the way economics was taught it was uh, changed and there used to be three factors of production and uh, you know land labor and capital and then land was pretty much written out of the economic textbooks and then we get to an event like 2011 and everybody says why did it happen well land and actually the bank the way the actual way the banking system works 
is never was never taken into account in the mainstream economic models that have this kind of circular e economy. Yeah, so I mean, what we do at Prosper really is to try and evidence all the time that land, natural monopolies, you cannot have, you know, a system of equality when you have these things. And, and bear in mind it as well in the economies that we have today, natural monopolies include the electromagnetic sphere. So, you you know, the domain names, the internets, which have as much to do about location and monopolizing those spaces um, and enclosing those spaces, if you like, as uh, land. So it's the agendas that we talk talk about is how to break those monopolies up. So in terms of the f recent federal budget that was released, how would you rate our government cover the common economy maybe or are they aiding the monopoly further? Because I think they haven't really done much reform. They're just really encouraging people to construct more grants. How would you rate that this budget will obviously will spur more activity, but is it good enough for long term reform? You're, you're absolutely right. There's no reform in this budget. So the budget, unfortunately, the trouble is right to reform a system which has really breastfed people on the notion that the way you get wealthy is through land. And then your the architecture of your economy is built around that because that has be, become the norm. Uh, particularly in Australia, in England, in America, and then in various parts of Europe, you can see this system at play. Anywhere really where you have very high escalating land prices, a term to capital growth. And to reform that system is a process of transition. It's very, very, you know, which really does mean a massive taxation reform. You have to take away the idea of speculation in land, boost productivity, and the best way to do that is to remove, stop taxing people on what they earn and start taxing people on what they don't earn. So land, the, as the old economists used to say, owners get wealthy without work or enterprise. You know, people, owners become rich in their sleep without any work or enterprise, right? So, and people here that live in various locations in Melbourne will have seen years where their property prices rise far more than their um, income. They earn more, their property earns more That's than their sure. income and that rise. Yeah, so there's only one way to, to kind of stop this and to reform this, and that is to encourage people to work. So, so we're not going to tax you for what you earn, but we're going to tax away the gains that you get from holding land and completely abolish speculation in land and, you know, reform the system. But of course, whilst you know, you can write an economic paper explaining that. And actually the Henry Tax Review did a really good job of it when that came out under the Rudd government. It came out, we were delighted with it and prosper because it kind of explained this and then explained this transition in order to simplify the tax system and encourage work and take away the land gains and everything. But to actually implement that politically, well, no one's going to accept it because people really don't want to work for a living, right? In a, when you've been used to this idea of speculating and, and you know, it, it's a very hard reform to implement. And, and that's really what we're seeing now. I mean, I spoke to a guy um, in the Treasury in WA early on in COVID. He wanted to have a chat and talk about what they could do economically. And we've had similar conversations with the Victorian Treasury about this. And everyone's on the same page. It's not, there's no economist worth their salt that doesn't understand what I'm saying. But the, prob the difficulty always comes is how do we do it and still stay in government you know how do you do that <laughs> do you implement it so what we're seeing now is in the budget is just you know hard hats and high-vis jackets and just millions going into the construction industry going into the infrastructure grants being given it's really something that is going to uh, enrich landholders more so than it's going to enrich the industries that were really hit hard in this global pandemic, which are the service industries. It's not going out there to help the cafes, the uh, workers, the waiters, and the you know people out there that are kind of serv servicing that community or, or retail or anything like that. I mean, th these are reforms that are just intended to kick the can down the road. And that's why you're seeing interest rates continually being lowered. And it's absolutely inevitable that those interest rates are going to go negative, which is what we will see happen. Uh, 100%. Do you think negative will come in Australia? Uh, I do. I'm pre-thinking my next cycles trends and forecast edition here because I'm writing specifically about that. But it is absolutely wow. inevitable. So, um, yeah, just think, think twice before you lock anything mm -hmm. in right now because it's highly likely 
that uh, interest rates are going to go negative. It's like I said, it's a it's a plan. It's been planned for a while. It's really to do with the levels of debt. It's not just about kind of trying to get the economy moving again, but there's just no doubt in it. And, you know, governments have been planning for this. Um, the Central Bank in England is now making preparations to go negative. New Zealand's banks are now making pre preparations to go negative. And of course, we've seen most recently Philip Lowe, uh, who said, oh, we're not going to drop below 0.25, you know, now saying that we're going to be cutting on Melbourne cut day, Cup Day or, you know, sort of putting that expectation out there. And it won't be the last cut. Catherine, what would it look like for investors and home buyers when the interest rate is negative, like with the loan rates? What does it mean? Well, yeah, well, it, it means that loan rates will drop and the precedent was set with the uh, Danes because interest rates have been negative there for, well, since 2012, despite the economy improving. So this isn't something that just turns around. And uh, they were the first ones to implement, um, I'm trying to think when they did it now, I'm trying to, th I'm trying to remember, um, I think it was last year that they did it. Anyway, they, they implemented the world's first negative interest rate mortgage, um, where it was at negative 0.5%. So, in other words, people were paying less back on the principal that they borrowed. That's unusual. <laughs> yes, so, so, so the loan is reducing by yeah. itself and then you're paying as well. So the overall effect is that it's getting smaller quickly? Is that yeah, the, 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 they're paying back less on the principal mm -hmm. exactly you know, than they borrowed. But of course, the banking system, <laughs> it's just it kind of gets off subject a little bit and it kind of again it gets into things that i'm writing about at the moment but mm -hmm. but we're about to enter a, a completely new system that we never had before and, and this idea of negative interest rates the banks will just work off fees so you know it will be a fee-based system that's how they will make their money and then they will compete on fees or however mm -hmm. else that they're mm -hmm. going to do but we are we are looking at a completely new model of banking and that really is a subject of private debt because if you go back to you know never has this been an economic plan previously because i mean well after the second world war debts you know debts were wiped out i mean there wasn't much to invest in and and you know the economy kind of being currencies were devalued and if you like the slate was wiped clean and of course if you go back you know to the ancient times they used to be debt jubilees where again you know periodically the slate would be right wiped clean because debts always have a propensity to rise above people's ability to pay and the reason that they do is because of the magic of compound interest it's just maths right so when you have exponential debt growth at some point it's going to be particularly in our financialized economy where most of our investment goes into fixed in place assets you know real estate stocks and bonds you know it's not going to build a new factory to create make things that's a uh, productivity of the type thing Correct. So, you know, so what we're really doing is is creating this great debt buildup and somehow that has to the slate has to be wiped clean. Now, you know, when the bank makes the makes a loan on the other side of the accounting sheet, it's called savings. I mean, this, if you like, is a way of writing down the debts and the savers. You, know, you can term it a war on savers, but the savers are pretty much the fat ones to be harvested. But you can only imagine what that's going to do to real estate markets in the future, particularly in, as this is brought in. I mean, it leads to anyone that's researched this, it leads in, you know, it leads into a whole host of things which will be implemented that honestly, where we're sitting now, look pretty horrific. But, you know, what we're looking at really is, of course, no one's going to be keeping their money in. So there's no savings account. I mean, you go back to the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, the banks were advising you to put your money you know, the best investment that you could make at 16, 17% interest <laughs> on savers account was to put your money in the bank. Now, the Commonwealth Bank is boasting that it's got an 0.9% rate for savers. So no one's going to be putting their money in the bank for savings and retirees, that's why you're seeing stock markets, you know, rise to all, all time highs. And then the Fed's, you know, certain governments trying to prop up, prop up the stock market by buying stocks, you know, the just absolute bonanza of speculation. Now, it, it doesn't solve anything, you know, any more than, you know, whenever you hear a buzzword or anything for economic reform, unless it's the reforms of the type that I'm talking about, you know, where, where you stop this kind of practice and you really make a transformation of the economy, then we're really just repeating the same thing that we've done for many cycles now and the cycle will continue. Can I ask you, time frame wise, negative interest rate? Talking 2020, like 2022, probably by 2022. Right. So it's 
Because the next card won't yeah. cannot be more, right? It's already point one. It's the next card, and I can only imagine what that would mean for our other alternative investments. Because obviously, it costs you money to, and your debt is reduced. Not something that Australia has. No, it's uh, it's new for well, well, basically well. the introduction to a cashless society. But it's it's. Um, I mean, it's inevitable because of the uh, because of the way our economies now deal with things and quantitative easing really just kind of propelled us there and the forcing down of interest rates over time. You know, unless you allow the system to collapse, if you like, and wipe the slate clean, then you're always finding a way to kick the can down the road. And as I said, going negative is part of that process, but it's also part of a much bigger process and it doesn't change the fact that we really do see from this as much as we did when the fed <laughs> was created the federal reserve and the whole history of the monetary system and how it enriches the the few at the top it's exactly the same it becomes more and more entrenched in those injustices and we see the greatest transfer of wealth in history just continually uh, but at the bottom of the pile, the system is supported, if you like, by this kind of parasitic thing that we all are encouraged to rush out and buy land. The, the banks literally mortgage the earth because for every, every new buyer, there's a new mortgage that's created and the interest is collected. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's just part of the, of the system that just continues. Okay, so Catherine, I'm going to ask you the, the questions now. Um, if you are already a, if you're already mortgaged, highly leveraged and you're already established investor what should you be doing now with this knowledge that uh, view that you've shown us should we be leveraging what's the best way to capitalize on this yeah i mean your your best roadmap as you like is if is the cycle so if we just go back to the cycle right the reason that real estate hasn't collapsed at the moment is normally when you get to the midpoint of the cycle the banks are in a better position to handle the downturn than they are because they've been through those reforms. So you have a real estate collapse and there's a flood of foreclosures that go on the market like in 2008. Then you have different countries and we went through the same here with the Royal Commission to the banking sector where the banks go through some kind of reform and it, you know, they're in a better position than they were when speculation's running wild at the end of the cycle. And that's why we're seeing them being able to hold off the mortgages and, and not kind of trigger a collapse. No bank wants to have a real estate collapse. We're seeing, you know, that things play out at the moment very much as we would have expected in the mid cycle, even though this downturn has, and, and every downturn, by the way, is called this, you know, the worst since the Great Depression. So we're not expecting real estate to collapse. In fact, what we're expecting is as I said at the beginning, you know, everything to turn and all of these reforms and things are, are only going to push people into the real estate market, not discourage them from doing it. So your your time to leverage really is on those upswings of the market where you are confident of what the cycle is going to do. And obviously you can bend the strategies depending on your own financial position. You don't want to get out of that until we're reaching the peak of the cycle. It's the last in that always suffer the most because they go straight underwater. But obviously, if you bought and you own real estate now, then you know where we're expecting the peak of the cycle, which is, I would expect it to be around 2026. Then you know that's the time where you wouldn't want to be getting in and buying. You certainly wouldn't want to be developing in it, right? But the the time for leveraging and the time for really acquisition is now. So, you know, I mean, you should be taking advantage of where we are now in this downturn. I mean, look, it's a it's, it's a funny thing to say because property prices haven't gone down as much as they did in 2018 when we had the Royal Commission. That, that really was quite a severe downturn because nobody wanted to step into the market. The stock continued to increase throughout that downturn. And as buyers saw property prices go backwards, this is when you have an economy where first home buyers actually don't want affordable property. <laughs> no one wants to buy property when the price is sliding backwards, right? So, you know, prices were going backwards and we saw property prices having the sharpest downturn, not sharp really, the biggest downturn since for 30 years. Right now, we haven't seen that really because people have not been forced to sell. So there's a limited amount of stock on the market and there's a degree of demand out there from people that are looking for places to invest in and uh, you know the home buyers and that that need to buy and that's really what's been holding the market up and in some states you know wa for example it's a really hot market wa in brisbane areas of brisbane also areas of queensland where properties are coming on 
line and then they're being sold you know by the next week we haven't quite seen that in melbourne but even in melbourne i mean what happened over when they shut the real estate industry down and nobody could inspect was there's two cohorts in the market right there's the the buyers that buy for need and the buyers that buy for greed the investors and the home buyers and the home buyers are your regular buying market so you really always do want a home if you're looking for capital growth which you should be in australia because that's really what the market is you can balance your cash the other way and you have to but you have to do it smartly but buying a house that appeals to a home buyer for example because they're the cohort that are always in the market then of course you've got the investors who are in, have no urgency whatsoever and the investors that are around in melbourne at the moment are the ones that are looking for a bargain i've got a few of them on the books right now who tell me we're in no hurry every single one and uh, we just want to hang out for the desperate vendor uh, well, at the moment, there's also not a lot of stock on the market and we have the Christmas run. So whatever the holiday is going to look like this year, no idea what's going to happen in Melbourne because we're, it's so different to where the other states have been. But there is this desperation for people to buy and sell prior to Christmas and get all of that wrapped up. So the market even here has got a little bit of pent up demand and there's a little bit of heat in the market. But even so, if I was really trying to time it, I probably would wait around and see what happens once we've cleared that in Melbourne in particular, because I know you said listeners were in Melbourne, because I think some of that heat might dissipate from the market next year and uh, then kind of see, because it could be that you, you could have better buying conditions. But ultimately, you know, remembering that every piece of real estate has an individual vendor with a different reason for selling. So a lot of the time it pays to be in the market anyway, just keeping an eye on what's going on, having an idea of what you want to buy based on your strategy and then looking for those properties that have been hanging around for a while and assessing whether they're going to be worth moving in on. Normally they're hanging around for a while because the vendor expectation is a little bit too high. But if you hover over them, you'll eventually see the price knock off. Other people will have, have moved on because they'll be looking at the new listings that come up and sometimes you can move in at that point. So Catherine, we've had uh, Martin North on the show and he, he spoke a, a little bit about uh, mortgage stress and the increase in mortgage stress that he sees. And he, he paints a, a very different picture moving forward in terms of, you know, in the next two or three years where um, he, he says that insolvencies and things like that will actually increase and that will possibly bring the price down rather than up. Like probably a bit different from what the picture that you're, you're telling us. Yeah, I think, I think the two perspectives probably come because Martin, you know, he looks at the data based on his surveys that he does and so he kind of postcodes this data and, and works out areas where you're likely to see more insolvencies and speculates forward based on that whereas obviously i'm using the cycle and then also my own on the ground experience assessing what's going on on the ground and working with buyers and really getting an idea of what the heat is in the market and why vendors are selling and i don't really you know i think it's there's definitely something in what martin says in terms of the location particularly when you go to the outer suburbs where you normally see higher elements of mortgage stress so there are areas where you should avoid for sure and there's areas where you should keep an eye on them but yeah i mean i, I think i know a few people that have kind of used martin's service i mean my, my um, strategy in in real estate again and it always depends on what you're looking for but if we're just assuming that people are looking for capital growth and they're riding up the cycle they should 100 absolutely stay away from the new estates buying anything in a new estate and i see numerous buyers kind of roll after that because they're sure that these new estates are going to go, they're not going to lose, they're going to go up in price. And of course, the yields pretty much pay, right? Or they well, they, they get an attractive yield out there. And so that's normally what, what happens. They kind of follow this, well, we'll just go for positive cash flow story. And really, you need a balanced portfolio if you're going to win. You, you need something that's going to be that growth yeah. and that equity in it. So, I um, mean, yeah, I haven't really kind of looked into that side of what Martin's doing, but we've both been... <laughs> around for a while kind of circulated and oscillated around each other. i think mm -hmm. we both have the same kind of a feeling about the real estate market and the economics behind it there were some great strategies that you gave before catherine i just wanted to for those investors that listened before like and what about for the newbies like the ones that getting into investment for the first time what path should they follow i mean they just engage you catherine or should i you know what are some of the areas that they should look for you know obviously avoid you said new, new estates. yeah yeah uh look just run from the government grants what all the government grants have done have enriched the big developers so the government grants for example are causing really a land rush into the new estates because the conditions around them 
They have a price condition around them. They're all to do with building a new home and they're to do with building it very quickly. So starting it within a period of time of when the grant comes. And so that really is, is uh, just like the home buyer's grant was termed by Steve Keen as a vendor's grant. This is just a developer's grant. Mm -hmm. But those areas, you know, the, the core drivers of what forces land prices up, well, there's kind of like a flow graph to it. It starts from, you have to go into a landlocked area, it starts from population growth. So this is a process of gentrification, if you like. A landlocked area is an area where, you know, it's been, everything has been built out. And if you take a bird's eye view of that area, you'll see that the land is increasingly being subdivided into two, three, four and five. So the developers are moving in on those old suburban land blocks with the old suburban post-war house on, which is still the investment that a lot of our biggest cohort of buyers, which are families with children or families planning to have children, want because of the backyard and it gives them a bit of land and private space. Once you see the developers moving in and chopping up those land blocks, it means we've got population going into that area. And the population going into that area causes this process of gentrification. It's new money, new couples coming in. The land, more and more land gets subdivided to accommodate the population. The unbroken blocks of land then naturally decrease in supply. So if you move into an area that is kind of on the cusp of that process happening, so in Melbourne, say, one of the areas that's having that kind of developing is Epping, um, because we've seen the ripple. What happened was the Southeast priced everybody out, right? You have to go right down to, I know, Aspendale or whatever to buy land under a million, and now it's over a million in Aspendale, but you know, you get the idea. So people started to move north of the city, and we saw Preston and Pasco Vale just suddenly go bananas um, in a very short period of time. This is in the first half of the cycle, kind of leading us up to this point. And then Thomastown, Laylor and Thomastown, you know, where you never used to go unless you wanted to be shot, you know, suddenly went through this process of gentrification where now houses sell over a million in yeah. those areas. And so, because it just gets gets what pushed further meadows? out. Broad Meadows. <laughs> yeah, broad, well, Broad Meadows, funny enough, got held back in price a little bit, I guess because it still had a, a bogan and, and so there was still an element of about Broad Meadows that buyers were avoiding but inevitably these areas have to go the same with heidelberg and heidelberg west you can look at the socio-economic profiles of them there's heaps and heaps of information online um, about it so you can kind of judge it based on that because you still do want a decent tenant right you, you don't want someone that's, you know it's it's something that you have to take into account but yeah anyway the you know epping is the government always has to build there's always a push then with the councils and that to build more infrastructure to cater for the needs of the population moving in and then of course if you're looking what you're ideally looking for for that capital growth is to get the land block that's unbroken in an area that has zoning again depending on your budget but that allows for decent subdivision so subdividing into two if you can find a land block that's say in a you know residential growth zone and that's the name we use for the zoning in melbourne they, they have different names australia-wide for different zones but allowing greater density then you're really holding something you know you're by its nature going to get more valuable yeah. But also in the future, it's going to attract cashed up developers who aren't quite in the market at the moment because it is very hard for a developer to borrow. But they are going to be in the market once the prices start to rise. Because when prices start to rise, it becomes more profitable, obviously, for developers to move in. And, and um, you know, you'll see this because the next thing we'll really be looking for is rents to rise. They're, they're not there yet because of the, the nature of this crisis. I feel like Dan Andrews, whenever I say something that comes close to what he says in his daily press conferences. But yeah, because, because of the nature of this crisis, we're not quite seeing, you know, rents sort of, we're not seeing rents go anywhere but backwards. But the, so that, you know, the, the big no-nos that you do not want to go for though, whatever strategy you do, whatever, well, first of all, whatever strategy you do, always take into account that it's nice to have it on land that you can do something with. So even if you are chasing a more positive cash flow and you want to move out into a regional area that has a better yield, you're not going to get as much capital growth, say, but once you've kind of exhausted and you want to change your strategy, maybe you've got some development potential on that block, right? So I kind of like to balance a portfolio out like that. But what you should not do, and it's not 
difficult, I'm sure, for a lot of people who have already assumed it themselves, is buy brand new property. So brand new apartments, you know, obviously don't go near them, particularly if you're in Melbourne. The only place really where, where apartments have generally done better is in Sydney, but that's because Sydney is very much a centralised core that is built out and up already. It's like London, you know, or Paris. It's not like London or Paris, but it's that kind of concept where all the land is taken and you're building up and people want to live there, so they accept the apartment. But it's new housing, new estates, that type of thing, or, or the dual income properties where, you know, you go to this new estate and the developers flogging off these dual income properties. And unfortunately, a lot of the time they go backwards in price. Before, before, certainly before they go forwards. And in the new estates, it often takes quite a while before you see the land values start to rise. So we see it in Tar Tarni, it's going okay now, anywhere close to the train station in Tarni. But for years and years, it went nowhere <laughs> until they built that train station. So until the population had gone in and, uh, you know, it had, had that population growth and it had, had that maturing, that's where the councils are forced to build the infrastructure, the train station or whatever else goes in, then you start to see the up. And, and the same in Point Cook. I mean, Point Cook was, used to be a, a dead area, but now that's had some inflation and, and that go on there. Okay, so, so you, you covered a lot on the west and north. What about the southeast? Because a lot of our viewers are on the southeast, like suburbs. Or is that already established and already expensive? No, not, not at all. I mean, the, the, the thing, I guess it's what you're looking for. I mean, any long-term hold, if you go southeast, there's many areas where you won't go wrong, where you're always going to have somebody want, that wants to buy that piece of real estate from you. Barring the end of the cycle, depending on the severity of the downturn at the end of the cycle, noting that two things happen at the end of the cycle. One, a flood of foreclosures which are normally try to be drip fed onto the market, but two, that the banks won't lend. And property is essentially worth what the bank's going to lend you. Mm. That's the, the motor of the car that, that, that gets you driving. But the, um, you know, I mean, if you, I mean, I missed out for a um, client of mine just before stage four lockdown in Melbourne on that kind of last day where we were all running around doing the last inspections that we were allowed to do. And um, there was a single level town residents in the McKinnon school zone and for people that don't know the McKinnon school is one of the top government schools the school zone is one of the smallest school zones it's in an area which is close to the bay and very well facilitated mm. and uh, the price got more than it would have got last year I mean it was there was just so much competition on this little home which was attractive to a number of demographics so my language to the investor that I was working with is that, you, you know, if we can get this for a decent price, we just can't go wrong on it because there's always going to be competition for something like that. And you can see that playing out in COVID. So it's not necessarily that you're going to get a bargain, but it's just that, you know, identifying those opportunities and trying to be in the market for them before things go bananas. Um, but anywhere really, um, Southeast, as long as you you use those same common sense factors. Your property is only worth what you can sell it for. So ideally you want it to appeal to the broadest buyer demographic. This is why apartments, even if they're in great locations, don't go so well because apartments are mostly sold to investors. Seven out of 10 investors primarily buy apartments. They Banks often don't lend on them for first home buyers. They have to, you know, lenders are pretty sharp. They have to meet a certain number of requirements. And first home buyers normally start their process of buying a home when they've already formed a couple around the age of 33 years and a small apartment doesn't cut it. So if you buy an apartment, even if it's in a fantastic location, when you come to sell it, you've really got an investor market, perhaps a bachelor, you know, a divorcee. I know you, you're really limited on your market of who you can sell it for. But if you've got, uh, say, the property in the McKinnon school zone, it's going to appeal to a downsizer. It's going to appeal to an investor. It's going to appeal to a young couple trying to get into the location. It's sitting well within the median in the area. So it's not like it's pricing certain buyers out. And if it's on land that you can do something with, it might well appeal to a developer that sees it as an opportunity to build for a family that want to get their foot in the door in, in that zone so you've got a much wider buyer market and it's going to create competition that's the type of real estate that you should be really ideally looking for and that's why your dual income properties and your new estates you know just just fail because they don't have those types of drivers wow 
we can be uh, talking on this uh, for another hour. I, I got a lot from you today, Catherine, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers will do the same. We covered uh, quite a few things. So you mentioned that look out for that the second leg, 2026, look out for the negative interest rate, which that, that actually shocked me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sure. Uh, and it probably, and I guess, and also you gave some strategies around what to buy and what areas to buy and focus on. And I, and I agree with school zones in Melbourne. Melbourne, I think, I'm not sure with other states, but Melbourne school zones at the peak is always the one that can't go wrong. Like always does well in a lot of competition. With with the lack of migration, like with the COVID shutting down, and you know, with the Chinese not coming to our country, do you see that as a lack of demand, like reduced demand? It's a really, really good point. I'm glad you brought that up because that's actually changed my advice a little bit with investors when they're asking me in, in terms of an Australia-wide picture. Melbourne's market has always been driven by population growth, as has Sydney's, but particularly Melbourne because we've always kind of won out on interstate migration and overseas. And the last time we lost migration like this was in the early 1990s and um, people just fled from Melbourne and the economy was really trashed and it took quite a while for it to turn around. So whereas the market is working now very much of pent up demand, you know, home buyers that need to buy, there's some people in other states that think that our market's about to become the bargain of a lifetime and let's get in now. We really cannot see a sustained rise until we are a city that's going to attract people back to it because that's what we need. And it's really concerned me over this time obviously being in the thick of it i mean i i think got listeners outside of melbourne but anybody who's living in melbourne will understand this i don't think there's anybody who would have wished that they were outside of melbourne over this period and i think there's genuine fear about whether we would go back into another lockdown because you can't beat a virus right? so we haven't beaten anything we've just suppressed it and we're hanging out to be all be poked with a vaccine but that does kind of concern me that um, element of it when they announced the when they leaked the roadmap which was wasn't the roadmap but then actually became the roadmap we uh, I just had numerous numerous calls from people wanting to get out some people have already sold now and gone and since then it hasn't stopped I've had real estate agents telling me at the weekend that they they are selling the vendors selling because they're moving and they want to get out of Melbourne so this is a worrying trend and it could be you know we're not going to get it back until they start allowing immigration to come back in the international students look like they're going to be the first to do that but until we get that and from what i am reading that's not going to be until the end of next year so until we really get immigration pumping again then it could take a while you know Mel melbourne may not see as good a gains for example as you will get in wa where these the states that are going to pick up on internal migration so people moving from melbourne or moving from sydney or wherever that is too expensive or going to other states and looking for better work opportunities that kind of change that covid has brought forward for all of us to think about do we really want to live here that's really interesting because i think in the last few years um like you said melbourne's had a positive immigration like uh, from overseas and from interstate and we were projected to out outgrows Sydney by about 2030 or so, you know, in terms of population. After this, I think we have to relook at the city and how we are traveling. And it'll be really interesting to see what the numbers really show and, and where, where yeah. people forecast. Yeah, yeah, t I totally agree. It's actually a cautionary point because um, I did some forecasting state by state back in December mm -hmm. last year where we knew a downturn was coming, right? So we knew the mid-cycle was going to be this year and, and we actually had it timed initially for the end of last year and then it just kind of pushed on, but we were waiting for that. And then I did some kind of forecasting based on anyway, but what it showed was that Melbourne and Sydney really weren't going to go so well over the next few years. And WA just looked like it was going to have this bananas boom. And I could not, at the time when that, I did it with an economist, uh, Philip Seuss, who works for a company LF Economics and he had initially sent me this data and I had a conversation with him at the time and I said I can't, I can't understand that because Melbourne has such great population growth <laughs> you know and it's always outperformed in, in every cycle really to that peak of the cycle the peak of this kind of 18-year cycle is uh, Melbourne and Sydney have always outperformed 
Uh, and you can see that, you know, when, when you go back, particularly over the last three cycles. So it was hard to conceive, and now obviously it's very evident in hindsight. But if that forecast continues to play out, then a long-term hold here, as I said, might not get you as much capital growth as you would get elsewhere, but then it could pick up, you know, in the following cycle. So it depends, you know, how long you want to hold for and how you want to use your real estate and what you want your acquisition to be. And it, and, and remembering also that we're talking Melbourne-wide, you know, it could be like we were saying before, that the house in the school zone is always going to attract demand. So it's going to attract enough demand. We're talking about medium prices. So the middle number of all prices not going to do as well as the middle number of all prices in WA, but it could be that it just really depends on what strategy you follow and what you pick. Well, Catherine, today has been absolutely amazing. We've been really looking forward to being able to have a really good chat with you about the property market and, and getting your views, and you certainly gave us uh, more than we <laughs> planned. It's so valuable. I know our viewers would have got amazing information from you today. Now, if they want to know more, though, where's the best place for them to find you and um, follow you and get involved just well first of all thank you for having me on like i'm always delighted to talk particularly as i know you've kind of been following some of this information and the the real motivation for me is to really expose everything <laughs> that i'm saying to you now <laughs> so that people do if they're going to be invest make the what right decisions but they understand the economic system underneath it and they understand the cycle um I really think that that's important. But if they want more information, they can go. As a bar advocate, my website is cashmoreco.com.au. If they want to um, sign up to the publications uh, that I write, it's under the Fat Tail Media website. And I'm sure you'll put the links up. But um, we'll Cycles, that. Trends and Forecasts is a very reasonable subscription and you'll get a ton of information in it. It takes us ages to write. <laughs> <laughs> that's why, yeah, it's the only thing I do. I don't do outside of anything I do outside of work is sleep. And then Prosper, if you want to find out the economic work that we do at Prosper, prosper.org.au. We do a heap of events during the year and talks and discussion groups and uh, so all sorts of things that people can take part in. Thank you so much, Catherine. As I said, I am also a developer and a follower for many, many years. So it's a pleasure to have you on and ask you personally what's happening, especially during this uh, crazy times in Melbourne and we might lose the title for Sydney. I will definitely lose the title. So, we, we, so, so we'll probably lag behind WA, which is a bit sad, but cover up in the second leg uh, towards the end 2020, after 22, you said. Yeah, yeah. Melbourne, it was definitely no longer the most livable city. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, we've really been through it in Melbourne. So I think we've all really felt the pain of uh, what's happened over the last few weeks. Thank you so much, Kat. For those, we will definitely put your, your links uh, at the bottom of the video. And yeah, please get in touch with this lady. She is very knowledgeable and about everything in real estate. And I do encourage you to subscribe to the Fat Media subscription because I'm I've been part of it and it's amazing value. So thank you again. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.